And then right now, because we are, we might do some uh, online presentation. We might use Zoom or Meet or some other uh, presentation tools. And we need to like try it first before we do the presentation. In that case, we can like found the troubleshooting earlier and then try to uh, find a solution for that. And then you need to check your background. Uh, I mean, it's a background image for your presentation. You might need to check your lighting and then uh, your speaker and headset and something else. Maybe you need to check your surround noise. And then you might, uh, for the offline version, you might need to check the operating system, the office, and whatsoever. For the online, you might need to check your internet. <coughs> you might want to uh, have a backup plan if if there is uh, some problem with the internet on that day. So remember, you always need to have an emergency backups, the internet, the handouts. What if you cannot do the presentation at all? You still need to do the presentation without any tools, maybe. Okay, yes, Raymond, are you raising your hand? Uh, yes, yes, I, am. I want to ask uh, what if the backup is that we pre recorded our presentation? Uh, it's the backup for what kind of failure? Uh, if for some reason, uh, we lost our internet connection and couldn't get it back up soon enough. Okay. Yes, it could be a way so you can, but if you like lost your internet connection, you cannot send it to your uh, your audience, right? Uh, maybe. Or you will send it beforehand. Yes, uh, maybe I will upload it to my drive beforehand. And uh, because my phone still has cellular data, I can just send the link. Okay. okay. That's a good preparation. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, and then the last thing you need to prepare is knowing your skill. Um, you need to evaluate yourself. Am I a good, uh, a good speaker? If I'm not, what should I do? Uh, I think if you prepare, you can always overcome everything that you previously know. Okay. So if I know I am not a good speaker, I need to like. Um, practice over and over again until I speak it fluently. If I know that I might lack the technical uh, the technical understanding, I need to learn about that. So I can be prepared when when somebody asking about the technical question. So the first thing that is very important is knowing that what I am good at and what I am like. Okay, now it is important to organize your material since uh, there is time limit for the thesis, def thesis def defense. Uh, there are 15 minutes 
time that uh, can, you can use for the presentation, but for the research methodology defense, you only give like seven minutes because you only need to presenting the first chapter up to third chapter. And then uh, for each page, usually we will spend like one or two minutes. So this is like uh, the way you like analyze whether your your pages is too much or too little or something like that. Because one time I found a student come to the this is defense and then. After he spoke for a couple of pages, he already spent like half of the time and then it's still on the first chapter. And then I'm asking him, how many pages have you prepared? He said, it's like around 50 something pages. Oh, it's impossible. You finish 50 something pages on 15 minutes. So you that's why you have to practice it first so you can know that uh, you can finish it in seven minutes in your case. And then the second thing important about your material of presentation is that because you are using something similar with PowerPoint, you need to remember that they name it PowerPoint for a reason, because it's the powerful point. It's not the powerful sentences. You don't have to put all the sentences here in the PowerPoint. So if you take a look at my presentation, uh, sometimes I give the whole sentences, but sometimes I only give some points. If I put the whole sentences, there is a reason for that. That is to help you read it later. But because you don't have to like let the reviewer read your PowerPoint later or later, you don't have to put the whole sentences. So you need to put only a short or summary statement you can use keyword, a certain keyword for that. Because you need to remember the concept of too long didn't read. People nowadays tend to not reading everything that uh, looks like have so many texts in, on it. And then you need to remember that uh, for its face, for its part, of your presentation, you need to have the beginning, the middle part, and the ending, the closure. And again, remember that less is more. Again, this principle used in many aspects in our life and uh, our presentation using this principle as well. So for each slide, less is more. For the whole presentation, don't talk about something blabbering and not important. You need to really focus on what is really important. The most important part is very important. So don't let anyone miss that part because you are talking about something that is not really important. Okay, this is, there is some quote, the secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending. And then the two has to be short. And this is uh, why less is more. Okay, for the beginning section, people like to, Indonesian people especially, like to 
said something uh, in a very long manner. So this is something that really not important. I take a look when she uh, became the master of ceremony in many occasions. They are like opening the event uh, in like five minutes with something that is not interesting and not important as well. So again, don't open your presentation with something rubbish or five minutes of thank yous. For example, thank you for Mr. Joko as the head of informatics technology department of Universitas Surabaya. And thank you for my first lecturer, Ms. Melissa Anga, who already like guide me until I create this documentation. Thank you again for Mr. Andre, who always uh, patiently helped me with my problem while I'm reading the documentation. Thank you for Mr. Delta, who this and that. Thank you for Mr. Vincent, who do this and that, and this and that. Thank you all, and today I would like to present my I already spent like a couple of minutes. You only have seven minutes. And then you waste it for that unimportant opening. And remember, all of us in that room would like uh, listen to, I think, 10 to 15 students. And if, if its students have that kind of presentation, have that kind of opening, imagine how bored we would be when listening to that. So the important thing is we need to know who you are and then uh, why would you hear? This is for the ordinary presentation. In our case, we already know why you are there because you are the student of research methodology. So just introduce yourself and talk about and like talk about your thesis topics. That's it. Because wasting time at the beginning would eat up the middle and at end part. And then for the middle section, this is like the main part of your presentation, the details of your presentation, no time for too many main points. So the hierarchy is like this, because sometimes uh, when you talk, you are not aware that the time is almost finished. So sometimes uh, the lecturer would say, you only have one minute to wrap up and then you have to stop. So it is very important to make the most important part at the beginning of each section of your presentation. And the last important part at the end of each section. So for example, if you're talking about the analysis of something, put like the conclusion first and then say, I, I came to this conclusion because of uh, because of my survey, find something like this. That means they already know that the conclusion and then uh, the less important part is the detail of the survey itself. So don't left the important parts. If you're talking too much on the introduction, you might not come to the conclusion or the analysis, and that is the important parts. 
Okay, for the research methodology and thesis defense, use the structure of documentation chapters. That is, the first part should be introduction. The second one, it should be the theoretical background. The third one is the analysis. The fourth is the design. The fifth would be the implementation. The sixth part would be the evaluation. And then the seven would be conclusion and suggestion. So the final section is the most important because uh, this is like the last opportunity to impress your audience. It should be a conclusion or summary. And then you can thank the audience. And after this final section, usually it would be followed with the question and answer section. Okay, this is the organization of the material, as I stated previously. This is, uh, they would have the same structure with your documentation. And because our presentation is visual, so we need to like remember why we need the visual aids because uh, people can like grasp the meaning from the text only like uh the se only like seven percent of it and then from the visual they grasp the most that is the 55th percent and then using focal you can most people can grasp the importance of it, the detail of it, around 38%. That's why it is very important uh, to use the visual aids. In our case, this is our slide presentation. We will talk about some, uh, some tips about the background design, the color text, and so on. Okay, the first thing is about the background design. It is very important to ensure that if we have if we have text or image or anything, that the audience can read it properly and conveniently. This is inconvenient, right? It is very hard for you, right, to read down this one. Especially if this is like the words that is not really familiar for you. Can somebody say what is right down here without taking a look at the source? Just take a look at your screen. What is the first word here? Okay, what is the first word here? Can anyone read it for me? Only the first word. Because you already know that word. Uh, no, it's actually oh, hard to read. Okay. <laughs> I thought you already know that word. No, no. Okay, but you're still correct. Uh, actually, we can... It is really hard to take a look at the letter M here. Okay, because, uh, because of the color of the text and then because of the color of the background. It is really hard to like make it proper. Maybe if it's not a solid color. So it is really hard to find the appropriate color for my text. If I give a background like this, like try to read the text below, 
What's wrong with it? It is not pretty, right? It is, uh, it seems, I don't know, because I put a solid background in our text, so there's no point. I use an image as, as my background because it would be like, there are some parts of the image that can be seen by the, by the audience. So there's no point if I put that kind of image. Okay, so this is about the background. So you have to remember about that. What is happening? Oh. Okay, the second is about the color. Again, the color of the text is very important as well. You should, uh, you should remember that usually if you need to present to your client or in this case to your lecturer, most of your clients or your lecturers is older than you. If you want to like give a presentation to a student, the students might be younger than you, but for the client, I think there are many people that might be older than you that could be your client. And especially the, your lecturer definitely would be older than you. So their eyes, their... Uh, the way they read text is not, it might not the same way with you right now. You have a uh, healthy eyes and they might, their eyes might have degraded on because of their age. So it is really difficult to read something like this while it is still possible even even when I'm not using uh, glasses, uh, glasses, and I consider my eyes are good, my vision are good. However, it is uh, like uh, because I'm already like 40 somethings, it started to degrade. So I can feel it. I still can read it, but it's not in it's inconvenient for me. So sometimes I ask you to like make it bigger when you do the presentation because I sometimes still can read it, but I know that my eyes are struggling, struggling when I try to read it. So rather than make my eyes struggling, I ask you to change the presentation. It might be happening on some other lecturers who are even older than me. So that's why I ask you to uh, consider that and try to use a good color that makes the audience easily read your points. Okay, the next part is about the text. I know that uh, sometimes you want to use a fancy fonts. However, the readability is the most important part. Uh, there is one time when some students like to use a combination of the capital and small letter in one word or one sentence, like the second text is. 
we might can read that, but it's inconvenient, and we are wondering why you have to write it that way. What's the point? What's the purpose? And then if you write everything in capital, actually, it is quite hard for us to read it. Am I correct? So it is better to read something in like capital combined with small letter, for example, a capital letter for the whole sentence or capital letter for at the beginning of each word. It is better if you are doing that way. Uh, usually people say that it is better to use a sans serif for a long or short one. For the multimedia students, I'm asking you right now. You are using the sans serif for the short sentence or for long sentences? I'm testing you. I think for the long man. Actually, it's for the short one. Sans serif, so without serif, right? Yeah. So it is easier for people uh, if they need to read. Okay, sans serif is like more simple and maybe for you, it's nicer to look at. However, uh, if you put it on a long sentence, it may reduce the readability. So for the long sentence, you need to, because it's very long, sometimes you are lost track in which part I already read. The serif part would help you to like, to help you knowing the part that you already did. So it is better to use sans serif if for the short sentence like this, but for the longer one, it is better to use the serif. The serif is like Times New Romans, but maybe you, you can use other kind of font. Sans serif is like um, Arial maybe. for the diagram. Now, it is important again to ensure that anyone can read it. So if you put it this way with that kind of text, with that kind of background, with the color, it is really hard for anyone to read your diagram. So you might try to use other than picture for the diagram. You might give a link and then uh, it would direct you to another page to show your diagram. <coughs> okay, this one that we take a look at previously. It's a transition and animation. You can, uh, you already can notice that it's time consuming. I like wasting like couple of seconds. It might be useful if you have like 30 minutes on or an hour of presentation because if people get bored, they would like a week because of the noise and because of the animation. But if you only have like, like seven or 15 minutes and there is so many things you need to explain, this is unnecessary. And again, uh, if you have like many kind of points, it might be this part could be a distraction for them. They already focus on something and then you have this transition and animation and then they like forgot everything. So this is just to like grab their attention, but if they already 
uh, have a tangent on your topics. This is actually uh, became a distraction and time consuming. Now presentation is the phobia number one. Actually, because phobia number one is fear of public speaking. So if you felt uh, uneasy on doing the presentation, you are not by yourself. And even uh, the lecturer, even that uh, we do this like, like, for me, it's already like 22 years already I did this. <coughs> but every time I meet a new topic and I need to do the presentation, I feel like this kind of phobia came all over again. So fear of public speaking is real. It's happened to many people and even to the presenter, maybe the master of ceremony, maybe somebody like me, I still like to speak in public, but the fear is there as well, especially if I don't know and never meet the audience before. Okay, so you don't have to worry if you have this kind of feeling, you are not alone. But to do that to uh, to overcome that fear. You can practice more than once. Uh, sometimes I need to speak on public, not in university. So it's more like uh, maybe I help the government and do the and I speak on some people about something. And then sometimes in my church, I need to teach. And sometimes I feel that fear again because I might not knowing the audience. And in my church, because of the pandemic, we need to record it. And I feel that fear back again because the one who recording is not the one that I know. So usually because I feel that uh, like two or three days before the time that I need to do the presentation, I kind of try to do the presentation over and over again. And it helps me. So to overcome that fear, you can do practice more than once. Practice makes it better. But the second thing that is most important about practice, it helps you build your confidence. <coughs> because you feel like, Okay, I have done this and it's okay without the audience, okay? Without the audience, it's okay. Or maybe if it's still not okay, you can do that again. Again and again until you feel that it's already good. And then you feel the confidence there. Okay, that's the tips number two. And then uh, to overcome the fear again, you can learn how to do a good presentation, like the one that we learned today. Okay, this is the how-to part. A good presentation, a good presenter always try to manage the tone of their voice and accent. Uh, if you don't know or never evaluate yourself when you are speaking try to record yourself and then try to hear it by yourself sometimes you would find that it is unclear what you are saying it might be because of your accent then you need to fix that but 
I cannot change my accent because I came from, for example, I I am born at Surabaya, so this is my accent when I'm speaking English. I cannot like change it overnight, but uh, because I'm aware of it, sometimes I like try to fix it after I, I spoke about it. So there's a way to like uh, to fix your accent actually by talking it again and then you listen it and then you fix it. And then the tone of the voice. You can uh, use the combination of high pitch and low one to help uh, people concentrate. If you talk in low, just low, from the beginning up till the end, it would be bored. If you speak in high, uh, high pitch, can you imagine listening to someone speak in high pitch from the beginning till the end around 10 minutes? How do you feel? How do you think you would feel if you're listening to the someone with high pitch from the beginning till the end. What do you think? I think that might be a bit uh, more of a subjective side man, because uh, I had a lot of people uh said that my my voice is actually uh on the lighter side uh, but i don't really hear it so uh i think it's uh, a bit more your more voice more. is what raymond it's on the lighter side but it's not a high pitch right uh yes high pitch mean uh I would like to give you an example. This is the, it's really hard for me to speak in high pitch. Um, today we will talk about the tone of voice, accent, formal language, gesture, eye contact, and so on. So remember to listen something like that around 10 minutes. High pitching volume. Some if you listen it uh, in a certain uh, times, it would make you feel irritated, inconvenient. So I don't say that people with high pitch need to change it, but actually people with uh, my voice is like meso sopran, so it's a standard. I can do lower and I can do higher. For recording, uh, for my recording, usually I use the higher pitch because if I use the lower, they said it would make my voice less. I'm not really sure. It's hard to listen to my voice. It's unclear or something like that. So I use a higher pitch for recording. But if you talk in uh, if you talk to the audience for around a couple of minutes, you need to use the combination of high and low pitch. Sometimes you can make a, make a point using the higher bits. You can make a point using the lower bits. If you already talk in 
in a higher pitch, then you can make your important part in the lower because it would make people listen more to you. So this is like the main part. If you already talk in lower pitch, then the higher pitch would be like the sign that this is important. And then the second one is about the formal language. You really need to use a formal language for your presentation. So if you are not used to that, that's why you need to record it and listen it and then try to fix it. You cannot uh, memorize anything, but if you do it more than once, it would like it would become uh, automatic for you. And then the third thing that you need to remember is about your gesture sometimes, but because this is an online, I think I think the gesture is uh, can be, cannot be seen by the audience maybe. However, if this is an offline presentation, some, some people um, develop a certain kind of gesture and sometimes it's not a good one. So that's why you need to take a look and record yourself while doing the presentation. Then you can find what kind of gesture that you already did and try to fix that as well. Eye contact, try to always put eye contact if this is an offline presentation. <coughs> the volume of your voice need to be heard. <coughs> and then try to listening again to your words. The clarity should be there because otherwise people cannot understand what you are talking about. We might hear you, but we cannot understand what you are talking about. Uh, sometimes when I listening to people speaking in English or sometimes even in Indonesia, I can hear his voice, but it's really hard for me to grasp the words. If you have a family next to you or friends, you can show them your recording and then ask them to honestly give their opinion. Is your words and sentence already clear enough for them? Okay, again, for the variety, because otherwise people would be bored. To add interest, change the pitch, change the volume. Sometimes you need to do it louder. Sometimes you need to make it slower. And then sometimes you need to pause. Especially when you would like to grasp the attention from the audience, sometimes you need to pause. Okay, again, if you are reading, we can figure it out. I mean, I always know when somebody do the presentation while well reading. Because their tone, their anything that they do, I mean, their voice, the way they speak is a bit different. When they are reading, or when they are memorizing. So this one, reading and memorizing, is a big no. It's really bad if somebody is reading and memorizing. You can use a cue card, and right now it's very easy for you to put uh, the thing that you're afraid that you will forget in your gadget. So you can take a look at that. 
and again you need to have a time management you need to uh, always aware what how many how long have you already speak so you should have time management so, so you can finish your presentation on time otherwise you would be cut off to overcome the nervousness you can read you can, like, like I said previously, reverse over and over again. So take a look at it and ask your friends to give their opinion and give their feedback. And on the D day, when you're nervous, you can always pause. Drink water to like buy some time. Slow down. Have a take a breath, and then smiling. Smiling is helping you and helping others. So, like, make you more relaxed. And then you can use the PowerPoint as a cue. Now for the question and answer sessions. You should direct and honest. Direct means you are not talking like beating around the bus. Because uh, again, your lecturer need to like asking, like to hear around like 15 students and then when they ask and then you like wasting their time by reading around the books it would make them more irritated so you should directly addressing their question and honest usually people reading around the books because Actually, they don't prepare with that question and don't know the answer and never thought about that. So that's why they are trying to talk blah, 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 something not important, something not really addressing the question in order to, so you usually try to make the one who asked the question confused and maybe you will forget about your own question and that's never be the case. We never forget that and we know that you are trying to like go from the initial question, try to run away from the initial question. So usually I will cut and say that you are not understanding my question. If you don't know the answer, just say so. And the second one, if you are not really understand the question, but you have an idea what kind of question it is, you might paraphrase the question. So you can ask, you can paraphrase, then ask this your question all about. To help you uh, to make sure that you are give the correct answer. The, sec the third one is you only need to compromise if you have to. <coughs> Usually, uh, you know the subject maybe more than your lecturer, but sometimes your lecturer know about it more than you. So if you think your lecturer made a mistake, what they are suggesting is have nothing to do with this thesis, then you, you need to say so. You don't have to compromise if that is the case. But if their suggestion is correct, you need to compromise. Okay, I will put that in my thesis. But if you think that 
this is ridiculous because that is a very different approach. So you, you can argue about it. So the fourth one, argue if you have to. But if you, because they always argue about anything, even though they are mistaken. Uh, some lecturers say that they only like being lazy and don't want to do anything. That's why they argue about anything. So if you argue and you have no point, you have no background, you have no backups uh, theory on your argument, then you don't have to argue because it would make you look bad. And to have the question and session before the presentation, you can try to brainstorming possible questions. to make you more prepared. That's why there is an LSTA, Latian Seminar Tugas Akhir. In that place, uh, there are some other students and there are a lecturer that would give possible question to help you formulate the answer before even they are asked. So uh, that's all about uh, presentation. Result would never betray the effort and preparation. So if you try to prepare it, it should be okay for you. Okay, so uh, for today, what you need to do in this class is try to create your presentation and try to present it. Try to get uh, feedback from other students in the breakout rooms and let them have a it would be like brainstorming possible question. Because after you present it to other students, they can give you some questions. Okay, so I give you 45 minutes. You don't have to create a whole part of the presentations, maybe only like the first or second chapter. But if you want to get a um, a feedback for your first, second, and third chapter, then it's okay. You can create the first, second, and third chapter. I give you 45 minutes to create your slide and try to, uh, in your breakout room, try to ask other feedback and maybe possible question to help you overcome uh, to help you like answer the question if it turns out to be the question from the lecturer on your this on your research methodology defense. Okay, so I will try to open maybe five breakout rooms. There are 25 of you, so there, there is only five person in its breakout rooms. Okay, I already opened the rooms. Please try to count the people inside the breakout room. Berapa orang ah? Bentar, belum minum.
Imalim.